Next up, we're going to kind of talk about how do we take all that stuff we talked about last time about gene linkage and how far apart the genes are and whether or not they have a crossover in between them and use that to build a map. Yep. Okay, so we can use a two-factor map distance to map genetic maps. So we can do all these different combinations. We want to find out what's going on on chromosome 2. We can look at black body to purple eyes, purple eyes to vestigial, and black body to vestigial uh, all separately in two-factor crosses. So again, here's our um, one of our genes, so the black body, and there's the other gene, and we're going to breed those flies together to get a F1 heterozygous that look all wild type. And then we take that back and cross with the all recessive individual. And then we can look and see what our, our result is. And we're going to see right off the bat that we've got parentals there, black body, red eyes. And our parental wild type body purple eyes are showing up most frequently. We are getting some recombinants. Okay. And so we would look up our recombination frequency here is to basically take the total number of recombinants out of the total number of flies and multiply that by 100 to get a percentage, we get 6.6% recombinance. And literally, that translates directly to map units, 6.6 .6 map units apart. Okay, So our recombination frequency, tell that's literally if, we were, if we're making a map not by where it is on the chromosome physically, but just as a relation to other genes, this is how they build these maps. Okay, is um, the recombination frequency tells you how many map units we are far apart. Okay, next one. Okay, so now we're going to try vestigial and purple here. So we've got a vestigial wing female or purple eyed male. Alternatively, you could put both of your mutations on the same fly, that would work too. In any case, you get your F1 that shows all wild type because in this case they are heterozygous for vestigial and they're heterozygous for purple because the cross up here, if you're not sure, do a Punnett square. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to cross this fly to one that has both of the mutations. Okay, So that one is VGVG PRPR. You could do out a Punnett square and see what the outcome should be if everything's segregated. Normally, it will not. These two are linked and you'll find that about 12% of the um, offspring have uh, the recombinant, the crossover uh, gamete types, and so therefore they are 12 map units apart. Okay, And so now that we have those two, we have our vestigial and our purple. Um, vestigial and purple was the total combination here. Um, we find that the, there was the 12 map unit one here, and the six map unit one there, therefore we can add those together and find that the overall distance between the two farthest genes is 18.7 map units apart. And we could test this by taking a cross and crossing our um, vestigial wing female and a black bodied male and getting one that fly here that is heterozygous for both. Cross that to a fly that is um, recessive for all the traits. And then uh, you would see that you'd get a similar, you get this sort of 18.7% there as well. Okay, so getting some interesting holdover with the markings here. Uh, but so the zero on the map is kind of arbitrarily defined. At one point they figured out stuff must be on the end of the chromosome and one end became zero and one end became, once you added up all the lengths between the genes, um, another number. So. Chromosome 1 is for recombination map length is 66, this one's 107, 106.2, and then the fourth the chromosome is very, very tiny. Okay. So the numbers, the recombination map numbers are here, they're compiled across lots of different two-factor crosses, and eventually they just added them all together and said, okay, well then these must be this far apart because these other genes are this far apart. This is all just based on the recombination um, rate in these crosses. Okay. And so what they found is if you have a related phenotype, like different types of like wing lengths, those are generally not linked to each other, not, not generally very close or further apart. And that genes that are inherited together, and that's what I think these little red marks were trying to point out, were that you have these uh, linkage groups, okay, that these genes tend to follow each other around, they're very close, so if there's a crossover, they're very likely to be together. And so a linkage group is kind of an abstract unit 
we can say the the linkage first linkage group on chromosome one the um, first linkage group on chromosome two and so forth is just sort of a common phrase that geneticists would use to before before they had mapped out and sequenced everything you would just refer to these as linkage groups not knowing if it was a chromosome or half a chromosome or a part of a chromosome yet okay. so there's our numbers that are all summed together uh, in order to get those long map distances there so a lot of work went into this so if you were doing the Morgan lab you're going to be talking a lot about um, genetic mapping and the various people that were working on it so so far we've just been looking at a two-factor cross but we're going to go take a little step further and look at a three-factor cross okay so if we're looking at three genes at once we can see um, the presence of a single crossover okay that's pretty pretty simple uh, and then our next step we can see this uh, so we see a c and <clears throat> big a little c and little c big c were common gametes there but we could also have a double crossover okay we could have crossovers occurring between each of these um, spots okay so we don't see any recombinant gametes in terms of A and C. Uh, and so you don't know if was there a crossover or not, or were there two? And that's where you end up looking at that third gene in the middle. Okay, you need to see that third gene in between A and C to see if there was a double crossover that possibly happened, even rarer than a single crossover. So we're going to take things up a notch and do a three-factor cross. We've got three genes on the same chromosome, okay? And we're going to do the same thing we did with the two-factor cross, where we have the heterozygote. Let me grab my little marker pen here. We've got our heterozygote, and we've got our homozygous recessive, okay? We're going to read that. We want to see where those dominant alleles show up, okay? We want to calculate the possible genotypes, the genotype ratio, and we're going to kind of... Uh, if we did a chi-square, we could assume independent assortment, uh, and then we could compare and see that it is not the case. So in this case, here's a here's our offspring. We predicted an um, a independent assortment ratio of it being equal. We our estimate out of 1,700-ish offspring was that there'd be about 212 of each, and that just so did not happen. Okay. Here's a giant mess of offspring there. So this would be an interesting chi-square to be like, yeah, no, there is definitely a significant difference between our observed and expected. Uh, these are not, this is the, um, this is the um, unlinked prediction. Yeah, this doesn't work. Prediction, which we can clearly see is not a good fit for the actual data. Okay. And so off we go with, well, in that case, since we, we can say they're linked and the next step would be to um, well let's find the order of the genes on this chromosome so uh, first thing we want to do is find the order of the genes figure out where uh, what's most like likely to be the parentals and then the single crossover and then the double crossovers okay so first thing we want to do when we're looking at this table of offspring is figure out where the parentals are uh, which of the gametes are just like the parent and didn't have any crossovers happen and there they are the big ones we got 700 of those suckers so here's a parental and here's a parental okay now we want to see the double recombinants mean that the um, two genes have stayed the same and one gene has switched and the gene that has switched is in the middle okay and so our double recombinants are going to be the least frequent thing to have happened so let's find those right here do that in blue here's our let's see if I can draw D double recombinant here our double recombinant and now we want to look at comparing the parentals and the double recombinants and see what happens so we've got whoop I'm gonna grab my yellow here we've got this um, big B little C and this big big uh, and this big B little C and hey the A switched there and this will match up if we look at the other parental that we've got little b big c little b big c and the a has switched aha so now we know that the order here is that the a must be in the middle because that's what's got swapped around 
during the, during the double recombinants. Very, very rarely A gets switched around, and that's the least likely thing, so therefore A has to be in the middle. Okay. So now we know that A is in the middle, and it's a good idea. I prefer you don't have to, you don't have to do this, but I like to, is just rewrite your genes in the correct order so that we know that A is swapping around and that we can put these in order now. We know that the here are the parentals with our 700, okay? I've moved to shorthand here just to, in order to not write out a six digit thing and everything. We can just, we know that the big B means there's a, a little B here. We know that the little a is, is over there because we crossed with that homozygous recessive parent. There's going to be a set of homozygous recessive um, alleles. And so we can just focus on these are the alleles from the heterozygote hetero, hetero alleles. Oh, why do I even bother writing on this? Okay. So here's our BAC. And so if we look down here for, here's the double recombinant where the A swapped. Okay. And then we can group these guys together because we've got our one single recombinant here. And in this case, this is where B, the crossover occurred in between B and A. So we can see big A and C here, big A, B, C here. And we see the Bs have swapped. And then down here, we paired them up by their numbers again because they're going to happen at roughly the same amount. We've got our recombinant two, and that's going to tell us just how far apart A and C are because this is where, let's say, the little b and the big A have stuck together from the parentals up there and the little b. So it's, I'll try to do this in class again, and I'll link a couple videos for this, but it is um, just rewriting your table in this format helps a lot just by pairing up all the uh, genotypes and that. Uh, and I will try to use letters that are not the same between uppercase and lowercase. Okay. So now we're looking at our um, single recombinants here, and we can take our, what was our total? Um, 1,700, okay, distance between B and A. We look at our, so here's the, this is where it was, B, A, C, here. And so this is, we have the A, C again, but the B has swapped. So we know this is our A to B swap. And then this is our A to C swap, okay? So for the B, um, the total number of offspring with the B to A crossovers is 200. So we just divide by total offspring, which gets us 0.111167, which is our rate of recombination. So this is the rate. And then we times by 100 to get our basically our percentage or our linkage map units or map units or whatever. It's just the combination there. So we divide by total offspring. We get that. And next we're going to do our distance between A and C here. This is our other recombinant here. Um, and we take our total number of offspring with the crossovers. By the way, that includes your double crossovers, hence why they're being all circled there. Divide by total offspring. 0.0647, that's again our rate of recombination, and then we multiply that by 100 to get our percentage or our map units, and so we can kind of fill this in as we go. Okay, okay. and then the distance between B and C, well, we can just add those together. We can take our 11.8 map units and our 6.5 map units, and voila, we now have 18.3 map units total. We could also do that via original numbers. It'll come out slightly differently because of the shenanigans with the double crossover. Okay. So map units is just kind of a estimate of gene relatedness, not correlated to actual chromosome location, but it does tell us where things are in relation to each other, which is very useful for um, uh, and how far apart they are. If we ignored A, we would have just had 290 recombinant offspring, and that gets us pretty close. So the others are 290 is 17.1 mu. But that's not paying attention to the gene that's in the middle. You know, it's, it's underestimating the, the distance a little bit. Okay. So your steps when you want to solve one of these problems, just as we walked through. First, you look at your table of offspring and determine, okay, where are the parentals, the ones that haven't changed from the, from the heterozygote there, <coughs> and the recombinants. And you sort them over, or sort them into groups. You determine your gene order via the double crossover. Which one happened the least frequently? Therefore, that gene is in the middle. Rewrite everything in the correct gene order. Pair everything up so you've got your 
your pairs of recombinants, okay? Then you calculate the map units of the single crossovers, and then you calculate the predicted frequency of double crossovers, which we'll do on the next slide, and that's where we get to our COC and interference. Okay, we haven't done this part yet. Let's do that right now. Okay, so um, our expected double recombinants is we take the, this is our um, A to B, rate of recombination and we've got our a to c rate of recombination okay times 700 we would expect to see um like 13 um double recombinants we would expect to see 13 total but our actual is five we actually just had five of each okay so we actually had 10. okay so you're expecting to see 13 if the rates had predicted correctly and so our coefficient of crossover here is our, just what was the, um, uh, how many do we see? What was the percentage of what we saw? So we take the number we actually saw and divide it by the number that we thought we would see, and we get this number, the COC, 0.76. So the observed number is 76% is of what we'd expect if the regions were actually independent of each other. Okay, and now we want to calculate our interference. Our interference is the probability that one crossover is interfering with another, and that is one minus the COC. So one minus the COC, okay? And that gets us 0.234, which is 23.5% um, there. That is how much they are interfering, and we are seeing a reduced number of double crossovers as to what we thought we would actually see. So here's interference again. This is the presence of one crossover is going to reduce the likelihood of another crossover occurring nearby. Okay, so you're going to ex always expect to see more. In this case, it's thinking about 2%, but they saw about 1.2%. And they do the calculation, you're seeing about 40% reduction in what you were expecting. Okay, so if, um, if the crossovers in, were independent events, uh, you would they would just show up just like we calculated but instead the observed number is lower than the expected number so they are not independent they are they are also kind of linked in a way and that's why we're calculating the interference it's usually higher the closer the double crossovers are to each other okay this is observed in nearly all eukaryotic chromosomes but the molecular basis is not yet known why do they interfere with each other we don't know yet so so here is a genetic map of e coli Okay, so it's a circular chromosome, so the genetic map is circular. Uh, so how in the heck do we have like numbers with crossovers? Because bacterial chromosomes don't do crossovers. That's literally a linear chromosome thing. Well, in this case, uh, the genetic maps for bacteria are the minutes required to transfer the gene by conjugation. So conjugation is when bacteria is sending their, their DNA stream over into another um, cell. And so what they would do is interrupt at different times and figure out at what times which genes were being sent over or not. And that is, we'll talk about that more in chapter 11, but uh, bacterial chromosome map is determined by, by time as opposed to by um, uh, frequency of crossovers. So some of the sort of stuff they did before DNA sequencing was the idea of mapping with a, mapping with a molecular marker. Uh, and then you can look at your gene of interest that's potentially in between two different markers, uh, look at the recombinant offspring that do have a trait or don't have a trait, and whether or not they also have a phenotype of interest, and then looking and seeing whether or not the chromos crossovers are occurring to the right or left. And so you can kind of put genes that you don't know, um, but know that are nearby other genes and use that to figure out um, where certain crossovers are. Alternatively, if you have a molecular marker and you know exactly where um, sequence changes are going to occur, then you can look at the recombination via sequence markers as opposed to phenotypes. So we're not going to get too much into mapping via markers in this 